Welcome to a new mini series where I'm going to be renovating this bedroom in our house with a few different projects. The first of which is insulating the outer wall with insulated plasterboard. Let's first set the scene and get ready for the install and then I'll get into the details of why I'm doing this, the different options for insulating and the building regs you need to be aware of. So this is how the room looked when we bought the house, pink wallpaper and all. We removed all the drawers and wardrobes, save for two, that we've decided to keep and we'll try to modernise in a future video. Next up, we stripped all the wallpaper off the wall with a steamer and said goodbye to the old carpet. I think it's looking better already. Now because we're insulating an outer wall where we're losing heat to the outside, there's a window, and below most windows are radiators, so it's likely that if you're doing this project, you may well have to remove a radiator too. First we need to stop the flow of the water through the rad, so on the left side I removed the metal cap and turned it off with an allen key. On the right side I screwed down the grey part of the valve and then turned the thermostatic valve to zero. I could then unscrew the connection between the radiator and the valve with a container underneath to catch the water coming out of the radiator. Make sure you have a few containers handy for this. You can see the flow stopping and starting as air makes its way back in to equalise the pressure, so to get a more continuous flow I open the valve at the top which allows air in. I could then unscrew the other side and I could lift the radiator off its brackets and poured out the sludge at the bottom in my pyjamas. I then put the radiator to one side and unscrewed the brackets. Radiators do vary slightly but it should be a similar process to remove yours. I did have an aerial socket in the wall as well, but when I took off the front plate there was no cable, so no issue. If you do have sockets on your outer wall, they'll need to be transferred inwards because we're adding a few centimetres of depth to the wall. So you have a couple of options. If there's slack in the cable, you may be able to pull it through, or you can move the socket upwards or downwards depending on whether your cables come from the floor or ceiling, as that gives you the slack for the wires to reach the new inner side of the wall. It's not as complicated as it may sound, and I do exactly this in my next video. Next I could pull the skirting away and take out the window board which doesn't come out far enough to accommodate the insulated plasterboard, so I'll need a new one here. Last couple of things are to cut the skirting on the walls adjacent to the outer wall. You could just cut the insulated plasterboard to the shape of the skirting, but ideally we want as little thermal bridging as possible. Back to the radiator pipes, I need to get the insulated plasterboard behind these, so I took up the floorboards. Despite mine being copper, they came from right angles to the wall, so I had the wiggle room to be able to move them back, which is where I need them to be for reattaching the radiator later on. Okay, we're ready, so why am I doing this? There are two main types of masonry walls. A solid wall made up of two rows of bricks, and a cavity wall which has the two rows separated by a gap. If my history's right, the 1930s are when cavity walls became mainstream. The 1920s were a mixed bag of solid and cavity walls, and this house was completed in 1926 and unfortunately missed the boat, and has the same solid brick walls the Victorians were so fond of. The downstairs extension built in 1985 downstairs does have cavity walls. If you're not sure, you can work it out by measuring the depth of the wall at a window. If it's around 225mm thick, you've got solid walls. A cavity wall will be around 300mm across. If you have exposed bricks on the outside, you can see that solid walls tend to have this brick pattern, whereas cavity walls tend to look like this. If yours is a cavity wall and the house was built between the 30s and 80s, it will likely be an empty cavity, which provides some insulating properties, but you can improve it by injecting insulation into the cavity, which is probably a professional job. If it's built after the 80s, the cavity will likely already have insulation and you wouldn't be watching this video. Solid walls are the worst for heat loss because there's no break between the inside and outside. Our house can feel pretty cold and the heating bills are quite high. So we have two choices, we can either insulate the inside of the wall or the outside. Generally, insulating externally is better because you can cover the entirety of the wall without breaks for partition walls or floors. You also don't lose any room inside that comes with internal insulation, and because you're making the actual brick wall warm, there's no risk of interstitial condensation, which I'll come on to in a minute. The downside of external insulation is that you've changed the look of your house as you may lose the look of bricks and may have to render or clad. The other problem is that if you're in a terraced or semi-detached house, your outer wall will jut out further than your neighbours, so it might look a bit weird and you'll likely need planning permission as you're changing the appearance. Perhaps it's better suited to be used at the back of your house than the front. So for all of its advantages, the drawbacks are quite significant and it's bordering on advanced level DIY slash professional job. So that leaves us with internal insulation. The risk here though is condensation. As things stand, the inside of the brick wall is warmer than the outside as it's in direct contact with warm air inside the house. 
We create a lot of water vapour through showering, cooking, drying clothes, breathing, but it shouldn't condense on the inside of the wall because it's reasonably warm. But when we introduce internal insulation, this then makes the inside of the brick wall cold as the insulation is reducing the heat getting to the wall. So if water vapour gets through the insulation, hits the brick, it will condense, form water droplets and potentially run down the wall and cause problems with floor joists without us even knowing. That's the risk, so the name of the game is to slow the water vapour getting through the insulation. Now I came up with three different options for internal insulation. The first was to build a stud wall next to the existing wall and insulate in between the studs. This was quite a bit of work and I'd lose at least 75mm of space and there'd be thermal bridging through the timber. The second option is a multi-layer foil. For this I'd need 38mm square battens attached to the wall vertically, then staple the multi-fold to the battens using aluminium tape on the joints. Then cross batten with more 38mm square timber and then plasterboard. The battens function to allow the foil to fill up the space and create a bit of a gap to allow heat to be radiated back towards the room. Supposedly it has a very good U-value, but I'd lose 100ml of floor space, but it's a good option if you need to conform to building regs, though I would be a bit concerned if any condensation does occur behind the wall, because then the battens may not fare so well. Maybe some DPC between the wall and the battens, but again, a bit more complication. As a bit of an aside, we've covered a lot of types of insulation on this channel, but not multi-layer foil before. It looks really interesting, but I'm struggling to find use cases for it other than pitch roofs where you would have battens on the top anyway for your roof tiles, but definitely worth being aware of. So that leaves us with insulated plasterboard, which has no timber, no thermal bridging, and tends to be thinner than the other two options. You can get different types of insulation stuck to the plasterboard. For me, the sweet spot is PIR. Very good performance for an okay price. Phenolic or phenolic core insulation, you get a bit more performance, but for a lot more price. And then on the other end, if you're going to the trouble of doing this project, polystyrene doesn't really move the needle enough to make it worthwhile. The other way to affect performance is to increase the depth of the insulation, which is a balance of cost, space lost and u-value. So what do the building regs have to say about all this? For renovations in England, walls should meet a u-value of 0.3 or lower for internal insulation, but that's still tricky to get to without pretty thick insulated plasterboard. Unfortunately, there are a few ways out of this. One, if over 50% of the element is being renovated, then it should be upgraded to the stated u-value, and it then clarifies that the 50% proportion applies to the internal surface of the room, not the whole external wall. This is good because I plan to do the same to the front wall of all the rooms. And two, the 0.3 u-value only applies if it's functionally feasible. Well, it's a small room, so it's not functionally feasible to lose too much space. So I'm using 52.5mm insulated plasterboard made up of 40mm PIR and 12.5mm plasterboard. There's no online calculator which will tell me what U-value I'll get with this as they all revert to the minimum thickness for the B-regs U-values. But the stated thermal resistance or R-value of the insulated plasterboard by itself is 1.8. A solid brick wall has an R-value of around 0.47. Add these together we get 2.27. 1 divided by 2.27 equals a wall U-value of 0.4. Four. That's my best guess and it's good enough for me. All I really care about is that the room is cosy and it brings down the heating bills. Unless you're using a wall lining system, the most common way of attaching insulated plasterboard is with dot and dab adhesive, which looked to me like a bit of a messy job. So instead I decided to try out Instastick foam, which leads me back to my choice of insulated plasterboard. Most of these boards seem to be foil backed like how most PIR insulation is. And I've seen that even with dot and dab, sometimes it's advised to PVA the back to get a better hold. Whether this is an issue with foam adhesive, I'm not sure, but the GTEC range of insulated plasterboard has a final layer of paper, which I thought the foam would stick to better. All right, the last piece of prep work is to check your existing plaster. Mine felt very solid, but if yours is crumbly or coming off the wall, then you're probably best off going back to bare brick, dusting it down, and then maybe spray some water on the brick before attaching the plasterboard to help the foam stick. All right, all this research and slide creation has stressed me out a little bit, so let's enjoy some classical music.
I don't know about you, but I feel more relaxed. Now, this last board is a good testament to the strength of this foam as it's not supported by other boards below it. I got distracted by some other tasks for a couple of weeks before adding fixings and none of the boards fell off, so I think it's a very good alternative to dot and dab. So all the guides from the manufacturers of Insulated Plaster Board mentioned mechanical fixings, but they don't state which to use. So I went with hammer in fixings, but in retrospect, I think these twist insulation fasteners would probably be superior. I put in two per board. For the window reveals, ideally I'd have bought thinner 20 or 30 millimeter insulated plasterboard to help with the thermal bridging and attach them like this. But these windows are solid metal with no thermal break. So if and when we replace them, that's when I'll do it. But I do need to cap off the PIR from the side. So I cut back to the width of some 15 millimeter plasterboard I had and use the insta stick glue to glue the plasterboard on. It doesn't seem to adhere too well to the PIR. So I ran a bead along the wall plaster and the plasterboard on the insulated plasterboard and that worked well. One happy side effect of doing this is thicker window sills, which I think look good. Couple of last jobs, I filled the void at the bottom with expanding foam and while I had the floor boards up, I added some thermal rock wall that I had left over from the garden room between the joists against the outer wall. Then lastly, I could use a flexible sealant along all four edges and in the joints between the plasterboard. I used acoustic sealant for this and this step does two things. One, it stops heat being lost via convection, i.e. drafts, and two, it creates that continuous vapor barrier I alluded to earlier. Between the plasterboard and the PIR, there's foil which will stop water vapor getting through and condensing on the brick wall, so using the sealant completes this. That's it finished, it just needs to be plastered and this is a great example of why it's useful to learn tape and jointing as it's not really economical to get a plasterer in to do just one wall. However, I'm having all four walls and the ceiling re-skimmed, so I am getting a plasterer in. Now this project does fall under one of the primary measures of the government's Green Homes Grant, but I put out a post on this last year to gauge reaction and it wasn't too favorable and I agree. This wall costs less than a couple of hundred pounds to do, so whatever discount you might get, you'll still be way ahead if you do it yourself. It's one of those jobs where everyone has a different opinion on how to do it but I think this foam really makes the whole process much more efficient. Okay that is a wrap. I'll cover fixing the windowsill and replacing the radiator once the plaster has been but if you enjoyed this video you might like to check out the next video where I soundproof the party wall next to this one. Thanks for watching and I'll see you there.